Good evening. Good evening. My name is Brady Hummel, and I have the great honor and privilege to introduce this year's awardee of the Rose Walters Prize for Global Environmental Activism, Elizabeth Colbert. Ms. Colbert is the fifth recipient of the Sam Rose and Julie Walters Prize at Dickinson College for Global Environmental Activism. The $100,000 prize recognizes an individual who has made a defining difference by advancing responsible action on behalf of the planet, its resources, and its people. Colbert is an author and a journalist currently on staff at The New Yorker who has written on subjects ranging from the use of focus groups in elections to the water quality in New York. However, she is most famous for her work on the interaction between humankind and our home, Earth. In 2006, she won the National Magazine Award for Public Interest for her three-part series published in The New Yorker titled The Climate of Man, which then influenced her subsequent book, Field Notes from a Catastrophe. Both pieces draw on a distinct parallel between human political, economic, and social behavior, and the scientifically proven evidence for global climate change in a well-crafted and easily accessible medium. Colbert's message is clear. Even though we have played a central role in causing global warming, we still have the agency and the ability to be able to take decisive action to mitigate and adapt to its effects. Her most recent work, a New York Times bestseller, which received the 2015 Pulitzer Prize for general nonfiction, is The Sixth Extinction, an Unnatural History. She details the most devastating extinction event since the asteroid impact that wiped out the dinosaurs, and shows that we are the ones responsible for the loss of such species as the Panamanian golden frog, the staghorn coral, and the Sumatran rhino. Throughout her residency here over the past two days, Ms. Colber has visited six classes with 160 students, as well as the student interns for the Center for Sustainability Education and the Alliance for Aquatic Resource Monitoring. This face-to-face -face interaction with students is a key component of every Rose Walter awardee's on-campus residency, and many students have benefited in years past from talking with previous winners, Bill McKibben, Lisa Jackson, James Baylog, and Mark Ruffalo. The Dickinson community is excited to welcome Elizabeth Colbert, the 2016 Rose Walters Prize winner for her public lecture tonight. First, before Ms. Colbert begins her lecture, Interim President of the College, Neil Weissman, will present her with the Rose Walters Prize. Please welcome Interim President Weissman. Thank you. Uh, it is my honor and privilege to actually formally award the Sam Rose and Julie Walters Prize this year. This is the fifth time that the award of $100,000 is being uh, given to an outstanding champion of the earth and our environment. Uh, Sam and Julie established and fully fund, I should note, fully fund the award. Really, they did it for two reasons. On the one hand, they intended it to honor uh, John Adams, not the second president who was a friend of Benjamin Rush, I should point out, but rather John Adams, who was a co-founder of the Natural Resources Defense Council and was president of the council from its establishment in 1970 until 2006, and he's still very active. He grew this organization to its current stature in which it has over a million members and a staff of 400 doing great work in defense of the environment. Indeed, President Barack Obama awarded John Adams the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2011 in recognition of his achievements. And so the Rose Walters Prize is yet another marker of those accomplishments. At the same time, Sam and Julie also um, recognize and support the work that Dickinson College does in sustainability education. And they saw a natural uh, symbiosis between NRDC and honoring John Adams and doing it in tandem with the Dickinson community. And this wonderful award comes from that. Uh, I should tell you that Sam Rose, class of 1958, is um, a real estate developer and an attorney. 
although it is not connected to this award. He insists whenever we discuss him that we point out he was a member of the Dickinson 1958 lacrosse team, which won our first and sadly only national championship <laughs> in sports. He is also an emeritus trustee of Dickinson College and in a very serious vein, in addition to the award, supports the college in many ways, including a very, very deep commitment to supporting financial aid and scholarships. And so uh, it is, as I said, my privilege and honor to be able to present the award to our speaker tonight, whom I'm hoping will arrive now on the stage. Um, thank you very, very much. Um, it's r really an incredible uh, honor to be up here um, following some of my real heroes um, in the environmental movement, uh, people like Bill McKibben and Mark Ruffalo um, and <clears throat> Lisa Jackson and James Balog, um, some of whom I know and some of whom I don't know. Um, but it's really, really a tremendous honor. Um, I. So I sort of want to start by thanking Sam Rose and Julie Walters, whom I met this afternoon, who are unfortunately not here, um, but it was my pleasure to meet this afternoon. And I also really want to thank um, the Dickinson community. I feel like um, I'm part of it by now, uh, after two days with you all. Um, and it's been a real pleasure. I've learned a lot, actually. You've given me a lot to think about. Um, and I really want to thank everyone here on campus uh, for their commitment to these issues of sustainability and for spending uh, so much time and being so interested and thoughtful um, about the issues raised um, by the Sixth Extinction. So I'm going to start. Um, I need, uh, I do need the projector on. <laughs> That's the one thing I need. Okay, so this, this fellow um, is one of my favorite characters from the book. Uh, his name is Kanoe, and those of you who read the book, and this is a test, if you got all the way to the end, uh, you will recognize him. Uh, he comes to, he's the character in the last chapter, and he's a Hawaiian crow, uh, or otherwise known as an alala. Um, and he looks a lot, as you can see, like an ordinary American crow, which you would find here in Pennsylvania and all across the continental U.S., um, but there's actually some significant differences, I'm told. If you're an ornithologist, you can tell he has a fatter beak, uh, and he also has fatter legs. And so before humans got to the Hawaiian archipelago, there were actually several species of crows on the islands, um, and they diverged probably from our crows here in the mainland um, several hundred thousand years ago. So this is a story a lot like the story of Darwin's finches, for those of you studying evolutionary biology. So an animal arrives, we're not sure how, uh, on an archipelago, and then it speciates out to fill different niches and to survive in different sorts of habitats. And the difference is that in the case of the Alala, most of the species did not survive until modern times. So this is the only one that did, um, <clears throat> and it is native to the Big Island. And it too is now extinct in the wild. Uh, the last wild birds were seen in 2002. And there are probably several factors that led to that. Um, habitat loss, a lot of Hawaii's native forests have been cut down, and introduced species. So introduced species like mongoose that maybe preyed on the eggs of the crows, and also, perhaps most significantly, the introduction of mosquitoes. Hawaii had no mosquitoes, uh, and now they have mosquitoes that spread avian malaria. So that has been a huge cause of loss uh, for some of Hawaii's fantastic native birds. So a few decades already before the last wild alalas uh, died out, people realized that the species was in big trouble. So they took some of the birds out of the forest, um, or what's left of the forest on the big island, and into a breeding facility that had been set up on a whole different island, so on, on Maui. And this is where Kanoe himself was born. Uh, and is, he is, as they say, um, an odd duck. Um, 
he was raised by people in this breeding facility, and so he, he doesn't seem to uh, see himself as a bird, um, or at least he doesn't see himself as a crow. Um, so one of the women who takes care of him told me uh, that he once fell in love with a spoonbill. And so Kanoe refused to mate with the other um, birds at this breeding facility on Maui. So at this point, there's maybe 100 um, birds. So let's say 50 of them are female, but he, he wasn't interested in any of them. And those are all the alalas left in the world. And Kanoe is pretty old now. He's over 20 years old. Um, and for precisely that reason, he was part of this very small population that was you know, originally taken in, or I guess a descendant of that. Um, so his genes are considered very important. So uh, a few years ago, he was flown to, San to California to go live uh, at the San Diego Zoo. And there he came under the care of a reproductive physiologist by the name of Barbara Durant. And every spring, when it should be mating season uh, back uh, on the Big Island, uh, Durant takes Kanoe on her lap and strokes him in a way that he is supposed to find very, very exciting. <laughs> and she is hoping um, that Kanoe will ejaculate and then she will collect some of his sperm and rush with it to Maui and artificially inseminate uh, one of the female crows there. And a couple years ago, when I was writing the book, um, I went out to San Diego. I went out to San Diego, and she offered uh, Durant offered to introduce me uh, to Kanoe, who turns out to be a very charismatic, um, if sexually confused, bird. <laughs> so he hopped over to see us. He has this palatial spread uh, out there in the veterinary hospital of the San Diego Zoo, a very big cage uh, that we could stand around in. Uh, and he hopped over to us, and it definitely seemed to uh, me um, that he recognized Durant. Um, he seemed a little embarrassed to see her. Uh, that might be projection, of course. Um, but to me, he seemed a little bit embarrassed, um, maybe because of their rather uh, intimate relationship. So Durant had, had brought Kanoe some snacks. Um, you may be familiar with them. Um, they are called pinkies. Um, they're actually little baby mice. They're so small that they have no hair, so they just are pink, and they're called pinkies. And if you're a crow, they are very delicious. Um, and so she had brought Kanoe some pinkies, and he hopped over to peck at them. And as I'm sure you all know, crows are very intelligent animals, and they can imitate human speech. Uh, and Kanoe says, I know, I know. Uh, and it sounds a little bit demented when he says it, uh, to be honest, but if you know what you're listening to, you can, you can make it out. And so to me, Kanoe kind of came to sum up uh, this very strange, very sad situation that we find ourselves in. Um, so here we have this crow, who is one of the very last representatives of his species, and people are going to fantastic lengths to save the species, They've set up a breeding facility. Uh, they are raising you know, his favorite foods. They are giving, essentially giving hand jobs to crows. Um, so people really do care about animals, about what the writer Rachel Carson once called the problem of sharing our earth with other creatures. Um, the fact that I'm standing here in front of you tonight, the fact that you are here today, these are all testaments uh, to that kind of commitment. Uh, and a lot of what is going on here at Dickinson right now is a testament to that commitment. I think for many people feel it as a moral imperative. Uh, E.O. Wilson has given a name to what he calls, quote, the human urge to affiliate with other forms of life, and he's called it biophilia. But at the same time, we are, as a species, as you know, uh, we are killers. Uh, we are driving more and more species to the brink of extinction, like the Alala, and we are driving more and more species over the brink. So Kanoe, in his black getup, um, with his kind of demented-sounded cawing, uh, I know, I know, um, made a big impression on me. And to me, uh, he is sort of an emblem for this great uh, mess that we have gotten ourselves into. So what is the sixth extinction? Obviously, the implication here is that there have been five earlier extinction events, um, and indeed, that's the case. Uh, 
This is a graph that those of you who read the beginning of the book are familiar with. It's a record of the marine uh, fossil record. Um, it's, it's a little bit complicated, but really all you need to know is that where you see those big sudden dips, those are points in the record where the number of marine families suddenly dropped. So those of you who are biology students know that the fam a family is a group right above the genus, and a genus is a group above the species. So if even one species from a family made it through this extinction event, that family counts as a survivor. So on the species level, the losses are much, much greater. So each one of those dips there uh, represents <clears throat> a loss of roughly three quarters of the species on Earth, uh, in some cases even more. So these are what's known as the five major mass extinctions. There are also more somewhat oxymoronically minor mass extinctions. Um, but these are just moments, and so geologically speaking, short amounts of time uh, when the diversity of life, for some reason, on planet Earth suddenly plummeted. And one pretty good description uh, of a mass extinction, which comes from two British paleontologists, is that mass extinctions are events that eliminate a significant proportion of the world's biota in a geologically insignificant amount of time. And another British paleontologist has used the metaphor of the tree of life. Uh, during a mass extinction, he writes, vast swaths of the tree are cut short as if attacked by a crazed, axe-wielding madman. So the first of those extinctions, number one there on that chart, uh, occurred at the end of what's known as the Ordovician period. That was over 400 million years ago. And at that time, most of life was confined to the oceans. So that was a very devastating event for marine life, uh, but not for other forms of life, since there really were no other forms of life. And the fifth there, number five, uh, that was um, about 66 million years ago. Uh, that was the event that killed off the dinosaurs. Uh, and there's a pretty broad consensus now, as you know, that that event was caused by an asteroid impact. Um, and I don't have a photo to show you of that, um, but this is a drawing that I think, uh, I, I always think that conveys a lot uh, in, a, in a short image, in one image. So, to see that we are in the sixth extinction is obviously a pretty serious claim to make. And the reason we're in the sixth, and some scientists would say uh, we're just at the verge, uh, maybe we can still prevent this, and some would say we're pretty deep into it already, uh, is that we are changing the world very radically and very, very fast. So not unlike an asteroid impact. And in fact, uh, you will hear, I have heard uh, scientists say, uh, this time we are the asteroid. So how are we doing this? You know, how are we changing the world on an asteroid-like scale? Um, unfortunately, the answer to that is that there are lots of ways that we're doing it. Um, but this evening, I'm just going to talk about three so that we're not here all night. <laughs> uh, the three that seem, for various reasons, um, the most significant, which is how we're changing the atmosphere, uh, how we're changing the oceans, and how we're changing what Charles Darwin called the principles of geographical distribution. So to start with the atmosphere, um, every year uh, we humans add on the order of 10 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Uh, that's coming for the most part from burning fossil fuels. Uh, everyone in this room knows this. I'm not gonna belabor it. It's, it's very ordinary stuff. Uh, we drive our cars, uh, we turn on our lights, um, and there are 7.4 billion of us on the planet right now, and it adds up very, very quickly. And what we are doing uh, when we burn fossil fuels is that we are just taking carbon that was buried under the earth over the course of hundreds of millions of years, and we are transferring it back into the atmosphere. So we are basically running geological history backward and at a very high speed. Um, we're taking a process that took hundreds of millions of years to run in one direction, and we are running it the other direction uh, in a matter of decades. So if you were an alien and you came to visit planet Earth, um, you might easily conclude that what, what we are doing, that the primary purpose of our modern industrialized society is to affect this transfer as quickly as possible. Uh, to see how much carbon we can get out of the ground and put up into the air and how fast we can do it. 
And of course, we have <clears throat> very good records of, of how well we're doing this. Uh, we are measuring this process on a continuous uh, basis in Hawaii uh, at the Mauna Loa Observatory. Um, so I'm sure that almost everyone in this room is familiar with this graph, one of the most famous graphs in history, the killing curve. It's just a record, continuous record of CO2 levels uh, taken uh, at Mauna Loa since 1958. Um, and I'm sure many people have read that CO2 in the atmosphere, so what we're seeing on the y-axis there is just parts per million in the atmosphere. Uh, you probably read or heard that CO2 has hit 400 parts per million. That is indeed the case where that green line is. Um, and you can see what you see in that jagged line um, is just a seasonal component to carbon dioxide. Um, carbon dioxide levels globally uh, go down uh, during the northern hemisphere summer um, when the trees in the, uh, of the northern hemisphere put out their leaves for photosynthesis, then globally CO2 levels go down, um, and that's just because there's more land and more forests in the northern hemisphere. And then in the winter, uh, when the trees in the northern hemisphere uh, go dormant, uh, CO2 levels globally rise. So right now, uh, we are at basically a low point for the year. Uh, and this is a very recent reading, you're seeing 401 parts per million. Um, so that up and down rhythm, that seasonal rhythm will continue uh, indefinitely. Um, and that going, that, but that upward slope will also continue uh, <clears throat> as long as we continue to pump CO2 into the uh, atmosphere. And presumably, uh, CO2 levels have reached the point where they're never going below 400 parts per million again, uh, at least not in the lifetimes of any uh, of, of the, those of us in this room tonight. Uh, and that upward slope is going to continue uh, until, as I say, until we stop uh, emitting CO2, which certainly at this point uh, we don't show much signs of doing. And if we want to know how we're doing on this grand project of putting CO2 into the air, if we want to know how we're doing on a longer time scale, um, then we have to look back at, at ice cores. So this is actually an ice coring station that I visited just a couple months ago on the top of the Greenland ice sheet. Uh, you can see it's quite a brutal landscape at this uh, particular place we're standing uh, on top of roughly uh, 8,000 feet of ice. Um, <clears throat> and what you, when you take an ice core, all that you do is you take a drill that looks like just a long tooth, a tube with some very nasty looking teeth at the end of it and you <clears throat> stick it down a borehole, and you set it spinning, uh, and if you're lucky, you pull up a cylinder of ice that's about a yard long and maybe six inches in diameter, and you just keep doing that over and over and over again until you get to the bottom of the ice sheet. And all that an ice sheet is, so this is true both of the ice sheet on Greenland and the ice sheet on Antarctica, is it's just snow that is accumulated year after year and not melted. So every layer, there's an annual component to that, every layer uh, gives you an annual record of two important things. It gives you a record of temperature, which you can extract by analyzing the isotopic composition of the ice, and it gives you an actual record of the past atmosphere. So in little tiny bubbles uh, are actually enclosed in that ice, and that is giving you a sample of past atmosphere. So if we want to know temperature uh, and we want to know what the atmosphere looked like, going back in time, we look at ice cores. So this is a, the longest ice core record that we have. Um, it's a record uh, taken from Antarctica. It goes back, what you're looking at is time going forward, 800,000 years on your left to the present day, okay? And this is a record of carbon dioxide levels taken directly from the ice. It's a core called the Epica core. Uh, it was taken by Europe, the Europeans. And those up and down waves that you're seeing, uh, those are glacial cycles. Uh, so Times when CO2 was low, those are the ice ages, uh, when huge ice sheets descended from the north uh, in, across Canada and all the way into the northern uh, US. <clears throat> so the last ice age, which ended about 12,000 years ago where I live up in Western Mass, was covered in a mile of ice. And those high points when CO2 levels are around 300 parts per million, those are the interglacials when the ice retreats. Um, and we are, of course, in an interglacial right now but as you see from that chart, uh, we have radically changed the shape of this curve. So CO2 levels have not been above 300 parts per million. Uh, so where that dotted blue line is, 
uh, for at least the last 800,000 years and probably a lot longer. Uh, it's just that we don't have any older ice. And now they're up around 400 parts per million, so just above that blue dot. And, and the reason that that dot says 2008, I'm not sure you can read it from up there, um, is because this is actually from a federal website that's um, no longer being updated. I don't know if it just got uh, too scary, uh, but they stopped updating it. Um, and the green dot is where we're headed uh, if we work hard to keep our emissions down. Uh, and the yellow dot is where we're headed uh, by the end of the century if we just let, keep on letting emissions grow year by year. Um, so by the end of this century, carbon dioxide levels will almost certainly be twice as high as they were uh, before we embarked on this great world-changing project, and quite possibly they will be three times as high. And if we want to go further back than 800,000 years, uh, we do have ways of teasing the composition of the atmosphere uh, out of some um, things like shells, little tiny shells that have fallen uh, to the bottom of the ocean. Um, so scientists have developed, uh, 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 developed some very creative ways of trying to get uh, records of the past atmosphere going back when we have no ice. Um, these methods are not as exact, uh, but they give us a pretty good picture. Um, and it turns out that if we want to find CO2 levels that are significantly higher than today's, um, we have to go back quite a long way uh, perhaps as far back as the Miocene, around 20 million years ago. And if we keep on pouring CO2 into the atmosphere the way we are right now, uh, we could very easily end up uh, at Miocene levels within the next several decades. And we keep, if we keep on going on that high emissions curve, uh, we could reach Eocene levels. So now we're talking about uh, levels that have not been seen in 50 million years uh, by the end of this century. And what's significant about this, as you all know, uh, is that CO2 has certain geophysical properties that make it a greenhouse gas. I am not going to give you a whole global warming spiel because you all know it, um, but this is very basic science. And the one thing that I am going to show you uh, is this wonderful contraption. Um, and I know that Dickinson has some of Joseph Priestley's old equipment, so I thought maybe you would appreciate this. This is a um, what's called a ratio spectrometer. Uh, it was developed by a British scientist in the 1850s, uh, John Tyndall, who was, one of, who was the first person to measure uh, the heat trapping uh, effects of certain gases. And he realized back in the 1850s that CO2 is a greenhouse gas. So this is not new science, uh, and it's not controversial science. Uh, it has been known for over a century and a half now that carbon dioxide traps heat uh, near the Earth. Um, and if you're raising CO2 levels very rapidly, uh, then all other things you would expect global temperatures to be going up rapidly. And indeed, as you all know, uh, that is what is happening. So the next slide that I'm going to show you, it, it's not a slide, it's an animation that was made by a British climate scientist. Um, and it's very beautiful, as you will see. Uh, and it's just showing you what's happened to average global temperatures uh, since we started measuring temperatures with thermometers back in the 1880s, so since we have a sort of accurate record of global temperatures, so over the last 150 years or so. Um, and the baseline is the global average for the period. Uh, I think it's a, quite a cool animation and pretty easy to understand, um, so I'm just going to play that for you. I hope, I hope it makes sense. So that red line there where it says 1.5, um, that shows that now CO2 levels are approaching 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, over the long-term average. And if you follow the debate uh, over the climate treaty that was negotiated last year in Paris, um, you know that there was this sort of aspirational goal of, in there of keeping average global temperatures, the increase in average global temperatures to 1.5 degrees C or below. But what this animation shows us is that we are very, very rapidly uh, getting to 1.5 C. Um, so this graph, and I, I, I switched it because that, that animation will play over and over again if you let it. Um, this is just a record of the uh, warmest years on record here. Um, and I don't know if you can read those little numbers, but uh, in red, that was last year, 2015. 
uh, the warmest year on record. Uh, it was an El Nino year, as you know, and El Nino years uh, tend to be warm. Um, now we are coming out of an El Nino in 2016, um, but that's 2016 up there, uh, the black line on top. Uh, so the first several months of this year were very, very warm, super warm, so warm that NASA in July, okay, when the year is only six months old, uh, already announced that 2016 will almost certainly be the warmest year on record. So what does all this mean uh, for, for life on the planet, for living things? Um, what this map shows us is that the warming in the world is not evenly distributed. Um, where you're seeing those warm colors, reds and oranges, those are areas that have warmed the most. And you see that the Arctic uh, has really, really warmed up disproportionately. And this was a predictable effect. It was, in fact, predicted many decades ago that the Arctic was going to warm up uh, by more than the rest of the planet. Um, and it's one of the reasons, or the reason, I suppose, uh, that the poor polar bear has become sort of uh, the icon of the dangers of climate change. So <clears throat> the Arctic is warming very fast, the sea ice is melting very fast, and if, like the polar bear, you depend on sea ice to hunt from, uh, then it makes sense that you're gonna be in trouble. But one of the points um, I wanna make this evening, and it's, it's not at all my point, I should point out, it is a point made to me by the scientists out in the field who are working on this sort of thing, um, is that the effects of climate change are likely to be even more serious in the tropics. Um, and there are a couple reasons for this, one of which, and perhaps the most fundamental of which, uh, is that the tropics is actually where most species live. So let's take for a minute the example of, of trees. Um, here in this photo, we are in a cloud forest in the Peruvian Andes. Um, so we're looking down from a point very high up, around 12,000 feet uh, down uh, that ridge. Um, and I went to this spot um, <clears throat> a couple years ago with an American scientist uh, named Miles Silman. And what Silman had done, he's, uh, he, he's a biologist, a tropical biologist at Wake Forest, um, is he had mapped out these plots of two and a half acres each going down that ridge, so at different elevations down that ridge. Um, so each plot uh, was two and a half acres, and in these plots uh, they had tagged and ID'd every single tree with a diameter of over four inches. So they had 20 plots that they'd mop, mapped out of two and a half e acres each, so 50 acres. And in these 50 acres, uh, they had found a thousand different species of trees. So if you contrast that with uh, the forests in Massachusetts, where I live, there are about 50 native species of trees. And if you go to Canada, to Canada's boreal forest, uh, there, where there's a, you know, <clears throat> one of the biggest intact stretches of forest on the planet, uh, in that whole expanse of a, of a billion acres or so, uh, you're only going to find 20 species of trees. So that gives you a sense of, of, of where the world's diversity is concentrated. So the point of this experiment, the point of going out there and tagging all these trees, uh, was to see what happens as the climate warms. So. One of the corollaries in the tropics of having a very high number of species is that in the tropics, species tend to have very narrow climatic ranges. So as we were hiking down that ridge that I showed you, um, and it took us three days to get from 12,000 feet down to about sea level, um, Miles Silman, the scientist, said to me, as, you, as we're going down the path, um, pick out a leaf with an interesting shape. Uh, and follow it as we go down that path um, because you're only gonna see that leaf for 100 yards or so because that is that tree's entire range. That's where it lives. Um, <clears throat> it lives in this very narrow altitudinal band now where the climate conditions are currently favorable. So by laying out these plots and by coming back year after year, uh, he and his graduate students were trying to see how these very narrowly adapted species were responding to climate change. Um, so to track climate, to stick with the temperature, the isotherm that they were used to, um, they were going to have to move upslope by several yards every year because that is how fast the climate in the Andes is warming. So, of course, you know, a tree can't get up and move, um, but it can do the next best thing, which is it puts out seeds, <clears throat> and those seeds get moved around, 
And if conditions are changing, then you would expect to see that species of tree sp <clears throat> sprout up in new places. And <clears throat> that is indeed what they found. Uh, they found that some species are moving fast enough to track the climate. Um, so let's say a tree that you used to find only at 2,000 2, meters, you know, maybe now you'll find it at 2,100 meters uh, or 2,200 meters. Um, but the vast majority of them are, are not moving, or they're certainly not moving fast enough to stick with the, with the climate. Um, they're just sort of sitting there. And so these tree communities, which have been very stable in the tropics over many thousands of years, certainly since the end of the last ice age, uh, are beginning to break down. And new communities will form. And then you have to ask the obvious question that comes to mind is what, what happens to the rest of the creatures, right, that are part of these communities, uh, the insects, the birds, the mammals. And they are much harder uh, to study for reasons that you can think of pretty easily, right? An insect uh, doesn't just sit there while you, you know, nail a tag into it. Um, and it's not there year after year. You can't come back and say, where did this insect move to? Um, so you have to be very clever in how you devise those studies, and people are working on that. Uh, right now. Um, but one of the points that Miles Silman made to me is, you know, that unfortunately uh, we have set this experiment in motion uh, and whether we want to or not, we are going to find out uh, the results of it. So how, how else are we changing the planet? Well, as I'm sure many of you know, um, you know, climate change is not the only effect of pouring billions of tons of CO2 into the air every year. Uh, there's also what's often called global warming's equally evil twin, um, which is ocean acidification. So ocean acidification is taking place because when you put up a lot of CO2 into the air, uh, a, a lot of it ends up very quickly in the surface waters of the ocean. It just dissolves in the surface waters of the ocean. And the chemistry of ocean acidification is um, a little complicated, not terribly complicated. Um, so I'm not gonna you know, go into the details right now, but Basically, all you need to know, and I'm sure many of you do know, is that when you dissolve CO2 in water, you get an acid. It's, it's a weak acid. If you had a Coke today or any carbonated drink, you drank it. Um, it's what gives um, our soft drinks that sort of a zip taste, uh, why we don't, you know, why soft, soft drinks that are flat taste very sweet to us, uh, kind of treacly. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a weak acid. Um, but if you add enough of it to the oceans, you change uh, their chemistry. So here are just a few sort of basic facts about ocean acidification, ocean acidification you know, 101. Um, the oceans have absorbed about a third of the CO2 we've put up there since the start of the Industrial Revolution. That's about 150 billion metric tons. Uh, every four hours, the seas absorb another million metric tons of CO2. And the net result is that the acidity of the oceans has already increased by about 30%. So we don't live in the oceans, and we don't have a very intuitive sense of what it means uh, to interact uh, with the rest of the world, to have your only interaction be uh, through the water. But there are, as you can imagine, many, many potential effects of altering the chemistry of the oceans for marine organisms. And many people are trying to study those on uh, using a wide variety of creatures. Um, but one thing that's pretty clear um, is that ocean acidification is going to make it more difficult uh, for organisms that build shells or external skeletons out of calcium carbonate. Um, just because of the way the water chemistry is changing, it's going to become harder and harder for them to, in effect, sort of assemble that calcium carbonate. And it turns out that there are an awful lot of marine organisms uh, who need to do this. So here's just a, a very, very uh, quick uh, sampling of, of, of what are called marine calcifiers. Um, these are little, tiny, microscopic organisms called coccolithophores. Um, they're at the very bottom of the marine food chain. You're seeing them here magnified many times. Um, they're very beautiful under magnification. If you've ever seen these pictures of um, water where <clears throat> the water has turned, the ocean has turned to sort of a milky blue because of a bloom of these tiny organisms, that, that's, that's what we're talking about. Um, common shellfish that we like to eat uh, need to make their shells out of calcium carbonate. 
uh, sea urchins, those spines, and their, their shells, which are called, known as tests. Those are all made out of calcium carbonate. Uh, starfish, these are very beautiful starfish that you see uh, in, on the Great Barrier Reef, these blue starfish. Um, and reef, reef building corals are, are calcifiers. That is what they're building reefs out of, calcium carbonate. So just to give you a sense of what an acidified ocean uh, looks like, um, several years ago I went to a really uh, interesting sort of natural experiment um, with some British scientists, and I was also lucky enough to go with, some, uh, with a photographer from National Geographic who took the pictures uh, that I'm about to show you. So the point of, of, of where we are is that we are, we're here, here in the Bay of Naples here. We're, um, we're in the water. Uh, we're not far from Mount Vesuvius, um, so we're off the coast of, of, of Italy. Um, and we had to go in the winter so that the photographer could take uh, good pictures because the water's clearest in the winter. Uh, so it was actually uh, the coldest place I've ever, ever been. Um, and what happens is this is a very volcanic part of the world and there's actually CO2 seeping out of the bottom of the, of the seafloor through, through these seeps, um, which you're gonna see in a second. Um, and what the scientists had the idea of was, okay, where the CO2 is seeping out of the bottom of the ocean, that water is acidified, right? It's the same as dumping CO2 in from the top. We're just getting it from the bottom. Um, and they said, well, that provides us a really interesting way to look at what happens to an acidified uh, ocean. So here we're away from these seeps. We have a pH of about 8.1, as you can see. Um, from that caption, and you're seeing a pretty classic uh, array of Mediterranean species here. There's some corals in there, there's um, a sea urchin that you can see, a spiny sea urchin there, um, and a bunch of sort of colorful seaweed, uh, which is also, there's, there's also seaweed that is a, a forms of calcifying seaweed that are kind of stiff and brittle. And you're seeing all of those in that, in that colorful uh, array there. So now we're gonna get closer to these seeps, you're gonna actually see that the, the bubbles, they're very beautiful, uh, and you're gonna see what the bottom of the ocean looks like as you get closer to them. So now we're up closer to the vents, um, and this is pH 7.8 uh, for all you chemists out there. Um, and what's important to realize about this uh, is that if we continue on our present trajectory of pouring CO2 into the air and just letting the seas absorb it, then all of the oceans, all of the world's oceans, uh, the surface waters of the oceans will have a pH of around 7.8 by the end of this century. And so we are potentially uh, looking at oceans uh, that look like this uh, up near the vents. So that's a pretty sobering uh, thought. So here's another place that I went with folks, some folks who are studying ocean acidification. Um, it's a place called One Tree Island on the Great Barrier Reef. It's a tiny little island. Um, you might be able to see that there's a, a research station um, on it. From this. this is an aerial photo, obviously. And Darwin, who visited a reef in the South Pacific during the voyage of the Beagle, wrote that reefs rank high amongst the wonderful objects in the world. And any of you who have been to a reef know that he was right. Um, something like 25% of all marine species spend at least part of their lives on reefs. And the result of experiments looking at the effects of acidification on reefs, and there are also a lot of people looking at the combined effects of acidification and warming, which as far as reefs are concerned is, is pretty much a double whammy, um, are pretty grim. Uh, the results suggest that reefs may not survive the current century. And the importance of this is pretty hard to overstate. Uh, as I said, it's something like a quarter of marine species spend at least part of their lives on reefs. And times in the past when reefs have collapsed, to go back to that mass extinction graph that we looked at at the very beginning of this talk, um, are associated with some of the very worst crises in the history of life. So it is likely that reefs will be the first major ecosystem in the modern era to become ecologically extinct. This is just uh, a quote that I pulled uh, from a, a coral biology textbook. It's not a radical statement. Um, it's just something that you will find nowadays uh, in the marine biology literature. So another way that we are changing the planet, and this is the last one I'm gonna talk about tonight, um, is by moving species around the world. 
So you're all familiar with invasive species. Um, I was recently in New Zealand where this is just a huge, huge issue. And New Zealand is an extreme case uh, because before humans arrived, it had no terrestrial mammals. It had a couple species of bats and that was it. So it didn't have anything like mice or deer or bears. Uh, and humans changed all this. Um, this is a Pacific rat. Um, as rats go, he's kind of cute, as you can see. Um, and the Pacific rat was brought to New England by the Maori, who were the first people to come to New Zealand uh, around the year 1300. And it was actually brought purposefully as a food source. Uh, the Maori intended uh, to eat the rats. Um, but the rats had other plans, uh, and they multiplied and spread a lot faster than they could be consumed. And along the way, they encountered a lot of flightless birds, um, flightless rails, flightless ducks, and flightless geese, so birds that had evolved in the absence of mammalian predators. Um, and since they had evolved without these mammals, mammalian predators, they had no defenses uh, against a creature like a rat. And so they were very quickly wiped out. And then Europeans came along and they brought more rats. They brought uh, ship rats and Norway rats who are even more voracious predators than Pacific rats. Um, and those were creatures that were brought accidentally. Uh, but the British also brought uh, in animals like rabbits um, because they wanted to hunt rabbits. Um, and these also multiplied like crazy, you know, multiplied um, like rabbits. And New Zealanders are farmers for the most part, uh, sheep farmers, and they ate a lot of farmers uh, out of business. So the New Zealanders were pretty pissed off uh, and they brought in, uh, they got the bright idea uh, of bringing in stoats, which are also known as short-tailed weasels. We don't have stoats in this neck of the woods. We have long-tailed weasels, but you get the basic idea. So they brought in these stoats to hunt the rabbits um, and stoats are, in fact, extremely good hunters. Um, but as you have probably already guessed, uh, they didn't go after the rabbits. Uh, they went after the rest of New Zealand's birds. So this set off another wave of extinctions that's still very much ongoing. And I'm just going to show you a couple of species that survived long enough so that we have specimens of them. Uh, these are birds called hui. Um, they survived until the early 20th century. Um, as you can see, they were really interesting birds. You're seeing a male and a female here. Um, they had very different shaped beaks, uh, the different sexes, uh, and it's uh, um, assumed that uh, the male and the female work together to capture different kinds of insects. Um, and this is a bird called the Stevens Island Wren. Uh, it's another really interesting bird. Uh, it was one of the very few flightless songbirds uh, ever known to have existed. Um, and it too was wiped out right around the beginning of the 20th century. So moving species is something uh, we do all the time now. Uh, if you go outside here at Dickinson, I'm sure we'll find many, many non-native species of um, plants. Uh, I'm sure many people at home have non-native species of pets. It's, it's once again something that strikes us as pretty ordinary. Um, but when you think about it, it's really something that's very, very radically new. Uh, because without a lot of help, a land species can't cross an ocean, and a marine species can't cross a continent. So we are, in effect, bringing together uh, these lineages that evolved separately for many, many millions of years. And when you do that, uh, you can get some very, very um, nasty surprises. And we have a very uh, good example of that right now here in the Northeast. Uh, these are bats little brown bats with what's known as white nose syndrome. I'm sure most of you have heard about white nose. It's, called, it's, it's killed millions and millions of bats in the US. Um, it's caused by a fungus. That's that white powdery stuff on their noses. Um, but it doesn't just affect their noses. It eats into their skin. Um, and it causes them to wake up from hibernation and to fly around uh, and to usually um, drop dead. And so the fungus has been traced back to Europe with genetic testing. Um, it was probably bought completely unwittingly to the U.S., maybe by some tourist. Um, and it seems to have arrived uh, in the U.S. somewhere near Albany, which happens to be right near where I live, um, and to spread out from there. And it is now in 28 states, uh, including this one, and in five uh, Canadian provinces. Um, <clears throat> this is a picture 
of me and a guy named Scott Darling a couple of years ago. Um, Scott is from the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department. So this is just after White Nose uh, arrived, and we are now we're standing in a cave in Vermont, um, a cave where before White Nose hit, something like 300,000 bats hibernated there every winter. And now those numbers are down by about 90%. And you can't see it in this gloomy picture here, um, but in this photo we are basically standing on a carpet of several inches of dead bats. So this bringing together of species from different continents um, is another way that you could say that we are running geological history backwards and at a very high speed. Um, around 250 million years ago, uh, all of the world's land masses were squished together in one giant supercontinent, which we call Pangaea and then they broke apart uh, owing to plate tectonics and the world as we know it today came into being. So by bringing together these lineages that have evolved separately, uh, we are in effect bringing all the continents back together again. And so you'll sometimes hear biologists say, uh, we are creating the new Pangaea. And so now is sort of the point in my talk where if I were following um, the usual rules, uh, I would tell you what we can uh, and what we should do about all this. Um, but as I've discussed uh, with many of you in this audience, in many of the classes that I visited, um, I don't exactly have that sort of an ending. Um, so instead, I'm gonna begin um, sort of, I'm gonna end sort of where I began, uh, which is with another uh, charismatic um, but sexually confused bird. <laughs> so this particular bird um, is named Sirocco. Uh, and I met him when I was in New Zealand. Um, he's, a, he's what's known as a kakapo. So kakapo are another example of a really interesting bird that exists only in New Zealand. Um, they are the world's only flightless parrots. Um, and they are big, they're about uh, the size of an osprey, um, and they're very beautiful. And at the si same time, as you can see from this uh, photo, uh, they're sort of comical looking. And they used to be everywhere in New Zealand, and now there are exactly 126 left. And all of them, um, except Sirocco, live on two remote little islands, uh, which have been cleared of rats and other mammals. But when Sirocco was a chick, uh, he got sick, he got uh, pneumonia. And so a lot like Kanoe, uh, he ended up being raised by people. And he was also imprinted by this experience, and so when he reached sexual maturity, uh, he kept trying to mate with people. Um, and as I said, kakapo are pretty big. Um, they're also nocturnal. So you had on these islands, you had people trying to help these birds recover, conservation rangers, also a lot of volunteers. Um, and during mating season, he would fly at their heads and try to mate with them. Um, so it was decided that for his own safety and for the safety of everyone else involved, he was gonna have to be moved. And so he now lives alone uh, on his own little island. Um, but sometimes he goes on tour so that New Zealanders can see a kakapo because except for Sirocco, they will never see one. Um, and that's where I saw him uh, uh, last year when he was on one of his tours. He's treated as sort of like a rock star. Um, people drive for, for hours to see him and pay a lot of money. We have to pay $50 uh, a head uh, to get uh, a half hour with him. Um, so Sirocco, I think, um, is another emblem um, of this very a strange world uh, that we are creating. Um, it is not, I think, because humans uh, are vicious or indifferent, though, though they or we are certainly, certainly have those capacities, uh, certainly capable of, of viciousness and indifference. Um, but as all of your presence here tonight testifies, uh, we also have many other qualities, uh, curiosity, concern, uh, caring, empathy, uh, biophilia. Um, so ultimately, I think we all actually have a lot in common uh, with Kanoe and Sirocco uh, in that we are confused creatures ourselves. Um, and I'm going to end there. Thank you very, very much.
Thank you very much for, for that very uh, enlightening, if, if not uplifting, uh, uh, talk. Uh, we have some time now for some question and answers. Um, and I'd ask those who are asking questions, keep them brief. This is not your opportunity to uh, give uh, lengthy comments to us here. Um, and we are going to take our first couple of questions from students. And do I see those who, who has the microphones in the aisles here? Please wait for a microphone to be brought to you. Hi, thanks. Um, it's crazy to believe that with all the evidence that you presented to us tonight, that there are still deniers, even some trying to become representatives for us in the White House. And as a journalist for the masses and a writer for the masses, what's your experience with deniers and what's your um, advice for us to politely educate people? <laughs> um, that's a good question. Did everyone hear the question? Okay. Um, it's a very, very dismaying um, fact or thought, and I suppose that was one of the reasons that I, um, you know, put in that slide. Not, not that I thought that there were any deniers here tonight, because unfortunately, unfortunately, I actually my experience with the deniers is very um, minimal. I, I rarely in, encounter people um, who, at least explicitly, come up to me and say, "I, I don't believe that." Um, so, you know, there's, there's part of the problem that, you know, we have such a polarized political world that, you know, we don't encounter each other. Um, but the reason I put in that wonderful contraption um, from John Tyndall, um, which I believe was built in 1859, was just to show, you know, that this is not new science. We're not talking about radical new science. We're talking about something um, that could have been, and in fact was predicted already by the 1890s, you know, climate change. Uh, the fact that if you dump a lot of fossil fuels into the air, uh, a lot of carbon dioxide into the air, burn a lot of fossil fuels, you're going to get climate change. That was predicted um, by a scientist named Svante Arrhenius back in the 1890s. So we're not talking about, you know, new discoveries here. We're talking about really basic science. Um, but I don't have a good answer for that. You know, we certainly, um, there's sort of no excuse anymore for that. Um, the evidence is, is overwhelming. The geophysics is, you know, um, irrefutable. Um, but it's very, very hard uh, for, you know, if people just want to say, well, I just don't believe it. It's really, really hard. So I don't, I wish I had, you know, the secret, um, you know, 10 word, you know, answer that you could, you know, give as, as people always say, your uncle, you know, at Thanksgiving, who is a climate change denier, uh, or Donald Trump, either one of them. Um, but, but I don't have that. And, and I know many people who are a lot, lot more um, knowledgeable than I am about climate change are struggling with, you know, just the same thing. How, how can we, we've said it 10,000 different ways, you know, how, what's the 10,001 that's going to make, make a difference? Signing, following this out in the lobby at the very end. So if you are here with a book, hang out. Hi, um, thank you for your talk. I was wondering if you could talk about, so in your book you mentioned the great auk, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, um, and other animals that as they disappeared, um, people sort of lamented the loss of a cultural heritage as well as a natural species. And I guess that applies to the kakapo as well. Um, so as we lose certain species, um, how do you think we also lose like a cultural heritage as we've sort of evolved culturally and biologically with these species? Um, so that's a really, really good question. And I think that um, in, in many places, I mean, I, I, Hawaii is one and New Zealand is another where they have these um, really interesting, you know, a, 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 avian fauna um, that exists nowhere else in the world where people do have a really, you know, um, es especially in Hawaii where, you know, birds have been part of, of the culture for, for a really long time and they're watching them disappear now. Um, people, you know, feel very strongly about it, but the question of, you know, 
you know, what, what are people losing? I'm not sure I'm qualified to say, you know, you, you kind of have to go to the different communities um, and, 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 and talk to people. I don't know if there's a sort of universal answer to that, um, except, you know, presumably a, a, a feeling, as you say, of, of cultural as well as biological loss. Um, and I think that um, to, to give you a sense of how strongly New Zealanders feel about their birds, you know, um, there are these huge efforts, and I, I, I don't have those slides right with me now, um, but I went and, and followed around people who spend their time, their spare time, killing things, killing rats, uh, killing stoats. Um, that's how they, you know, um, that's they volunteer, they form neighborhood associations to put out rat traps, they enlist the local, you know, kids, school children, there are campaigns, you know, get out there and kill rats. Um, so, you know, it's a really, it is, um, I, you know, I wrote a piece where I, 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 I said really not jokingly, you know, in New Zealand, you know, killing uh, small furry animals brings people together. It really is um, something that they take very seriously. So I think that that's a good um, example of people who are very, both both culturally, you know, New Zealand's a very, you know, young country from a European perspective. The Europeans have only been there a couple hundred years, but, but they are very, very attached uh, to their birds. Um, and they are, you know, really trying uh, to, to, to save what's left of, of, of these birds by doing some things that, you know, most of us would consider to be really gross and not the way we'd want to spend our leisure, you know, time. Uh, so, above the species and subspecies levels, are, are there any large groupings of animals expected to go extinct? Um, I think that, um, you know, the group that's usually pointed to right now as the, the most endangered class of animals um, is amphibians, where something like 40% of all amphibians who, who, uh, whose conservation status is known uh, are classified in some way as endangered. Um, but I don't think right now, in, an, in a sort of imminent way, anyone would say, you know, all amphibians are going to go extinct. Um, so, um, you know, I think in terms of major, major groupings, you know, we, we are not at the point where we're, you know, going to drive a whole class of organisms extinct. Now, one group of species that is really, really in trouble, and there is just uh, a bunch of spate of news reports about this are our very closest relatives, right? Um, all of the, you know, we have, we have, uh, you know, the four great apes, you know, um, chimps, bonos, gorillas, orangutans, they're all uh, in various stages of endangerment, and gorillas are very, very endangered, and orangutans are very endangered. So, um, interestingly and sadly enough, you know, as we go, as we talk about, you know, finding intelligent life on other planets, really, you know, very intelligent life on our own planet uh, is very highly endangered. So I guess one, one group, it's not a major, you know, it's not a big group, it's sort of a small group, um, but are our, our, our very closest relatives. Um, my question was, so at what point in the kind of the history of humans did the um, sixth extinction begin? Did it begin kind of during when we started burning fossil fuels in the Industrial Revolution or when we started to manipulate the environment during like the Agricultural Revolution? Well, I mean, we could, we could potentially go even further back than that. You know, some, some people would say it began, um, you know, when we, when we first moved, you know, out of Africa, when humans first moved out of Africa and humans reached uh, New, uh, Australia very, very early, shockingly early, around 50,000 years ago, and there was a big wave of extinctions of very large animals, some really extraordinary animals are so extraordinary that we can barely believe they existed, huge, giant turtles, um, and, and um, 
animal that's sometimes called a rhinoceros wombat. So, you know, marsupial that was the size of a rhino. So really, really interesting creatures, and, and they're all gone. And um, I think, uh, in general, you know, uh, uh, the preponderance of evidence is that, you know, humans wiped them out very early on. So, you know, potentially we, we will look back and say, well, this has been going on for quite a long time. And then, you know, the impacts have recently ratcheted up quite, quite a lot, especially, um, you know, sort of with, with globalization and a lot of extinctions that can be traced um, to, to people arriving, especially on islands, because islands are very extinction, sort of vulnerable island uh, fauna, um, arriving with rats. And th those are, of the documented extinctions that we have for the last several hundred years, you know, th those are a very high proportion of them. So globalization turns out to be you know, for, for the, from the perspective of, of things that evolved in isolation, a really raw deal. Okay, so we do have some questions uh, uh, coming in through uh, social media. Um, this question is from uh, Will Kaczynski, who some of us know. <laughs> And he asks, given your career in media, what do you see as the most effective way to reach a broad audience with this information? A book, a tweet? How should aspiring <laughs> scientists best communicate their work? Um, that's a really good question, and I'm sure I'm not necessarily the best person to answer it. Um, and I had a lot of conversations today with students about you know, the future of of journalism and what is the best way to communicate now in, in, in this sort of increasingly you know, attention-driven world. So it's quite possible, maybe I should have just sent out a tweet and not written a book. It's kind of a, <laughs> it's kind of a really interesting and alarming thought. Um, but I don't, have, I don't have an answer for that. I think um, uh, reaching a really Big audience, which is you know what 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 many people are trying to do, um, it, it, you know a book is probably not the way to go. To be honest, um, you know a lot of there are a lot of good documentaries out there, as I'm sure you all know. So people are are trying all all different media, and I don't have a I don't think there is one clear answer. And I don't think it's you know it would probably be to, it probably would be to get you know Beyonce to tweet it. That would probably be the best um, thing that we could do. But in the absence of that, and and if she's listening, I hope that uh, she will. Um, but uh, in the absence of that, you know, I guess my the only point I can make is 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 you know we got to we got to we got to sort of try everything. And I think people are you know I think I think there are people doing really interesting. Um, things in all sorts of different, you know, media from artists to, uh, you know, rappers. So I, I think that there, I think there are a lot of interesting things going on. So I don't, I don't, I, I think, I think there's room for everyone. Uh, on the one hand, uh, the extinction of flora and fauna strikes warm and fuzzy feelings uh, in the spirituality of human, humanity. But the other side of that uh, spirituality uh, drives people to uh, desire rhino horns for their superstition and their religions command, be fruitful and multiply and have dominion over all the beasts of the field. Uh, how do you contemplate the balance, the tension between those two aspects of spirituality? Um, th that's a really good question. Once again, unfortunately, one to which I, I do not have a clear answer, a good answer. I think that, um, you know, you're, you're absolutely right that, that um, you know, one um, big driver of, of you know, yeah, pro probably extinction right now is, is poaching, right? Poaching for, for rhino horn, poaching for ivory, which is used either in, you know, um, medic you know, 
medicinal ways that we certainly uh, in the U.S. would not consider medicinal at all. Rhino horn is made of, of keratin, which is like, you know, basically eating fingernails, um, but it is sometimes um, uh, claimed to have medicinal qualities, and that goes for a lot of very rare animals. There are, you know, tortoises being killed for medicinal purposes. So, um, you know, I, I, I think implicit, you know, in your question is, you know, sort of do we, you know, how do we respond to, to traditional and spiritual practices that, you know, result in, in what we would consider to be, you know, sort of wildlife crime. Um, and I think that, um, you know, I, I guess, you know, we do have international law <laughs> that, uh, that should be preventing uh, that, you know, even, even if people on the other uh, end, the receiving end of those goods, you know, have genuine spiritual beliefs, you know, we, we do have laws that are supposed to prevent uh, that sort of poaching. Um, so, you know, when, and, and, and in the, the level of, you know, dim, you know did, did, did God give man dominion over all creatures, I would point people actually to uh, Pope Francis's recent encyclical on this subject. Uh, it was a really uh, amazing document. Um, it came out last year, uh, or last spring, I guess. Um, he wrote a very, very heartfelt, uh, beautiful uh, uh, encyclical in which he took on exactly that. He took on, he addresses that phrase, what does it mean, you know, be fruitful and multiply? What does it mean that man, uh, that the Bible says that, that, that man has dominion over nature? And he, he really took issue with it. So uh, issue with the interpretation that, you know, this is just here for humankind and whatever we do is, is okay. Um, so I really, I'm going to defer to Pope Francis on that as a <laughs> religious authority. Um, and I think it's really, um, I think it was a very important document. I don't want to say that it's going to, you know, re you know, reverse all trends, but I think that when the Pope, you know, speaks, a lot of people listen. Um, so, and as I say, I commend it. It was translated into English uh, quite nicely, and it's, it's, it's really a, a very moving document. So we have time for just one last question up here. Uh, I know there are some others who may have questions. Um, I do invite you to stick around and have conversation uh, after the event officially ends. There will be a book signing, um, but there are lots of us here who would like to discuss these issues uh, further, so do stick around after the uh, formal program. So this extinction that we're causing, do you think that we will survive the extinction, or do you think that our actions are taking such a toll on the environment that it won't even be able to sustain us? Well, um that's a good question. I, I flirt with that question at the end of the book, um, and people are understandably very concerned about um, the fate of humankind. Um, and I, I guess I think of all the species that you know probably can survive human impacts. You know, humans are probably uh, up there. Um, we are a very, very cosmopolitan species. We live everywhere. There's there's 7.4 billion of us. Um, we're very smart. Um, so, you know, I think that long, you know, my own senses, and I'm not, you know, I, I, I do not claim to be, um, you know, a soothsayer here, um, but if you were betting on, you know, a species to do okay uh, for the next, you know, um, period when a lot of other species may be done in, you'd say, well, probably humans are going to be okay. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not, you know, a lot of damage that can be done between um, you know, extinction, which means getting rid of every, you know, breeding pair on the planet, uh, and, um, and, you know, everything being hunky-dory. I, I don't think everything's going to be hunky-dory, um, but I don't, I don't foresee, uh, you know, human extinction as, a, as the inevitable endpoint of this, which, you know, which isn't to say we couldn't muck things up so badly um, that we don't endanger ourselves. And there are, there are you know, very... Um, uh, reputable scientists who, who would argue, you know, we are monkeying with systems in such a profound way that we are potentially endangering humankind. So I, I don't want to dismiss that as a possibility. Please join me in thanking you. Thank you very, very much.